It's time for another episode of Halo the Series Declassified, where we'll be talking all about episode three and joined by Charlie Murphy, who plays the mysterious McKee. Plus, we'll be taking a look at all the elements that went into crafting the world of the show, hear from members of the Halo community, and so much more. It's all happening right now, so gear up, Spartans. Welcome back to Reach, everybody. My name is Sydney Goodman, and this is Halo the Series Declassified. This is your first stop if you're looking to dive deep into the latest episode of Halo, and there is plenty to unpack in this episode, including the first appearance of all-around icon, personal friend of mine, and of course, friend of the show, Cortana. Hi there, Sydney. You called? I was just saying how great it was to see you come to life on TV. Life is an interesting choice of words but I understand your meaning. While I'm here, I should mention that from this point forward, all plot points and character developments from this episode are fair game for discussion. Thank you, Cortana. I just love the way she delivers a spoiler warning. Don't you? But you heard her, everything's on the table, so if you haven't watched the episode yet, get on it. However, if you've been briefed and you're ready for action, then we've got a real treat of a guest for you today. You've already met the very curious McKee in the first couple of episodes, a human working with the Covenant. <gasps> I know, right? But this week we got a little more insight into why that is. Take a look. Joining us today, perhaps from high charity in the deep reaches of space, is the incredible Charlie Murphy. Hello. Charlie, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to chat with us. Off the bat, I have to ask a question that everyone's asking, which is, how the heck does a human like McKee end up working with the Covenant? Oh, well, it's a long story. And you see snippets of it in the first couple of episodes, her kind of origin story. So she was kind of, I suppose, from her point of view, rescued by the Covenant. And then she's reared um, with them and, and believes to have these, you know, special um, gifts that they nurture. So that's that's where she begins, just from a very young age in that environment. Do you think, does she see the Covenant as family? Yeah, I think so. I think Mercy raised her from, you know, a very vulnerable age of about, you know, seven or eight. Um, and she's had no real human influence. And any human influence she did have wasn't a very positive one. So, mm -hmm. so she sees them as very much a, a nurturing um, you know, very trustworthy family, mm -hmm. even though, and I'm sure she feels like a bit of an outsider. All about perspective, right? What kind of opportunities does a character with such a complex origin story offer you as an actor? Oh God, it's there's so much scope there because mm -hmm. having that kind of dark and turbulent start in your life, for an actor playing that part, it gives you just so much scope. She has been denied by her own, raised by what essentially everyone thinks are these dark and, and horrible presence in the universe. But she has found um, some sort of stability there in such a bizarre way. So there's, there's so much, there's so much to play with. And of course, obviously, because she has these gifts, they use her and she gets to enter this human world that isn't her own and and what she discovers there is just so much fun really for for an actor to 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 discover yeah i mean as a viewer as a fan i'm really excited to continue to see that interaction and actually the first interaction that we really see past her origin story as as an adult is um when she enters the unsc ship and things just don't really go the best for them. To say the least, how does it feel to portray a character who seemingly has so much power? Does she see herself as powerful? Because she has, has these gifts, she, she does have a source of power that others, they don't have, or that she hasn't witnessed anyone else that is like her. So she does feel, she has been raised, she has been raised to believe that she is special, but there also is a vulnerability there in, having never met anyone else like her. So is that there's that weird thing of knowing that she is powerful, but also feeling completely at sea. Speaking of her powers and how they're really, it's her and Master Chief, AKA the demon. At this point in her journey, what does she think of Master Chief? What does she make of it? Is it intimidating? Is it exciting that there's somebody else that also 
could relate to this power? How is she feeling? Oh, very confused, I think. I mean, she's on a mission to bring back the demon, Akashanko's head. Speaking with the showrunner, Steve, and, um, you know, Kiki and everyone on board, that we all, we all felt that, you know, she, she was coming from a place of real belief in her belief system is everything to her and what she was raised to believe. If she doesn't believe that, then what was her life about? And was she captured or was she, you know, what is this? So it is a believing to survive like a cult member, basically. Forgive me because I've heard the language's name said multiple ways. How do you say it? It's Sanghili? Yeah, yeah, okay. I say Sanghili. Sanghili, yeah. so you actually learned it. What was it like to learn Sanghili? That was, I mean, like for an actor, again, such an opportunity to do something like that. Neonik elk o pritanjehe. Perfect. Again? Neonik elk o pritanjehe. When do you get to learn a brand new language? It's, you know, a, a language that nobody else has heard yet, mm -hmm. which is like such a privilege. And David Peterson is incredible. And he is like, you know, been uh, connected to Dothraki. And so just very um, iconic um, person in this world. So, yeah, I mean, do you want to hear some of it? I would love. I would love to. Okay. I can I can remember from episode three actually what she says in in on the ship. So it's Nani Stuhom Duriga Nirink Warut O Mori Ok Oga Hamichitam Radion Rin Marrojaka Traji Jangago Morino Marrojaka. You know, a walk in the park <laughs> to learn. So it's so easy. It's so easy. Well and the what is it called? Like trills and the movement of yeah. your tongue and throat. It's so impressive. How did you manage to retain it? Because I feel when I've learned languages, the general sense is, oh, speak it with other people and that'll be so helpful. But obviously yeah. there's not a huge pool of people that you could practice with. No, no, no. and hopefully down the line, I'll, I'll, I'll come across some people who can speak it. I mean, I'm still learning it. I think it's fascinating. Um, I'm the only one in the cast who had to learn it so it was difficult rehearsing it because i'm at the beginning with a lot of puppets or aliens who are puppets <laughs> but yeah so it was it was um it was interesting it was an interesting process it was a lot of voice notes um mm -hmm. from david a lot of call and response and and learning it phonetically and learning the intonations and yeah but um but so enjoyable and such a privilege yeah, is there a word or a phrase that you can teach us? Oh, uh, hirajo, which is blessed one, and that's um, what the Covenant call Mickey. Oh, okay, hirajo, is that close? Yeah, oh. that's good. Okay, great. Well, we're joined by hirajo today. We've talked a lot about Mickey being this very complex character. Was there anything that surprised you about Mickey that maybe wasn't apparent to you when you first started developing her? As, as, you know, more episodes came in and we, you know, she began to unfold on her own mission and journey, I realized how, how childlike she is. And that was just like a, a lovely discovery. And I suppose that really makes sense because her childhood was taken away from her. It's a very arrested development for her, even though she wields such power and has these strong beliefs um, they kind of spiral and become undone. And, and what's left is is the beginnings of someone growing up actually and i think you'll get to see that over the course of the next couple of episodes really excited to see that develop more without spoiling for future episodes what can you say about mckee's story um during the season what are you most excited for fans to learn about her mm. oh gosh lots of things and lots of things i can't say because i mean because she's on a mission she is discovering a lot and that that is her aim and I think she learns a lot about herself, but also she discovers something pretty incredible um, along with one or two other key characters. And that's just gonna be very exciting to, yeah, to see what people think about that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking us into McKee a little bit more in your process and just for taking the time to chat with us. Oh, it's been a pleasure, thank you. We're so lucky that we can just fire up Paramount Plus and watch the latest episode of Halo, fully formed with all of its incredible effects, creatures, and stunts. But for the creative minds who had the very challenging task of bringing Halo to live action, it was just a 
teensy bit more complicated. Take a look. This is a great leap forward. Hey, my name is Roel Arnay and I'm a director on the Halo TV series. So yeah, this is my uh, office. So here I do all the, th the think work. And uh, so on the wall, we're kind of building the world, right? world building. And I always like to be surrounded by the world that I'm filming. Okay, let's do that. You know, I like to visualize the story into images. And uh, so when I read the script and then you go to these locations, there's all these visual ideas that come to me. Now here is the fleet called the Spartan uh, Barracks with the Spartan Bats. And uh, here we're gonna do a very cool scene where John is kind of looking in front of a mirror and he's taking out his emotional palette. Master Chief, what are you doing? In the script it was saying that Cortana shows up in the mirror. But then I was like, okay, that's okay, that's cool. And we can do that very simple. But it would be great if we do a transition where Contana then shows up with him in the normal space. It'll be easier if you let me help. Down. Now make a 1.3 centimeter vertical incision. Trust me. So this, those things I, I uh, come up with, and uh, that's my job, best job in the world. And of course, I saw this uh, hanging at the art department and I said, uh, that is mine. Because I want to have the Master Chief in my office, right? And Big wide shot of uh, the spaceship in slip space. And then here's the uh, open location. I was like, okay, what about we're going to see this world and then in this world, this beam of light comes down and we don't know what this beam of light is. And then this huge, big clunk of metal crashes down. And now we're revealing the world and we see that the spaceship is kind of dumping all the trash on this open planet. And the kids have to go through the trash and find things that are good for them. And that's where we find young Maki. So we're doing kind of a Wally -E kind of world. And, uh, and the show, I wanted to do a Wally -E kind of shot. So I pitched it to them and then they were, oh great, so we wrote it in. And then of course we do storyboards. But this is uh, the scene, for example, where Maki uh, gets taken. And the Sangili have this device with them where they detect pieces of the artifact. So this machine will glow and do all these things. It's a practical build, it's beautiful. And you're gonna start here, mm -hmm. push them the button, okay. so then it opens up. This machine goes behind Maki, and now they realize the real trophy is Maki. Because he has the same power as our Master Chief. You're gonna crawl to the left side, you stand right in front of them, and then you put, yeah, put the book like this and you make a decision, okay, I will go with these guys. And the process is I have two storyboard artists and with one of them I do kind of uh, the story visual effects moment and with the other one I do more big visual effects shots like also like spaceships. We're going to have this shot where we have these spaceships coming towards each other and there's this pot flying from one to the other. So I use toys and then I pitch these moments and beats to the storyboard guys and shots. They make photos with their, with their phones and then they're gonna draw these out. Action, you guys walk in and the moment when they land, you can put on the helmets and then the camera pulls out. Okay. Best job in the world. I'm going to queue up something special that I think you'll get a kick out of. Stand by. What is going on? Your abs are falling off. <laughs> Good.
Halo means to me community, being able to meet wonderful people, uh, make new friends, it's awesome. Through the process of this, I found the 405th Infantry Division. And many of the people that I met through that forum that were some of the originators are now some very dear friends of mine. And there is a whole host of builders that inspired other builders that are inspiring other builders. Just being around so many different talented people, you always feel like there's somewhere that you can be, someone that you can go to, and that's just super inclusive and I love it. This is the first time I've worn the full suit outside of like a test fitting. This is a Halo 5 EOD. All of this finished and handmade by myself. This is actually a Halo 4 armor set, and I'm not a fan of the Halo 4 EOD helmet, but I am a fan of the Reach and the Halo 5 EOD helmet. I am so excited that there's an EOD in the Halo TV series. Originally, I built this for a senior project in high school, because I thought it would be a neat way to not write a paper. It's been a journey. I've had a lot of fun with it. My advice for beginner cosplayers is, do it. It's not as hard as it looks. Just find a character that you like and just start from scratch. You gotta start somewhere. My first suit was a cardboard suit uh, that I built when I was 11 and it was the Master Chief um, and it was a sight for sore eyes but I did it. I've always liked the default look of the Spartans and so I went with the FJ Para kit. The suit, I would say, chose me, not the other way around. What mainly inspired me to get into cosplay is seeing all the other Halo cosplays. I've been a fan of Halo since 2001, and I've always seen these Halo cosplayers growing up, and I've always wanted to partake in that. Being able to make a full suit of armor and essentially be somebody else while you're in it is pretty cool. Halo is a story of self-sacrifice to me. People that are rising above the challenge to do phenomenal things, self-sacrificing for saving humanity. And for me, that's what's inspiring. It's about giving back. And the 405th is about giving back to the community, and we're the same way. There's something else coming through that I think everyone should take a look at. Stand by. Go where I want to go, do what I want to do. So bringing Halo to life for television has been a daunting task. First and foremost was taking all this amazing storytelling and canon and characters and carving out one season of story to tell the audience. Then it's how do you build that world, how do you design that world. Our goal was not just to make everything look cool, but make it look real and feel lived in. Welcome to the rubble. I have probably the best set uh, on the show to date. Uh, Soren's habitat, where he lives, is a part of what's called the Rubble, which is a group of asteroids that orbit around each other and they're linked by a chain of relatively low-tech gondolas, actually. He has his own giant asteroid that he has had bored out, tunneled out, and uh, made into a habitat that he can live in. It's just like the hippest thing in the world. This has been one of the main things, is to allow the audience to understand immediately where they are within a story, because we've got Fleetcom, we've got Madrigal, we've got the rubble, you're jumping around, and the characters themselves are jumping around. So that was one of my main prerequisites, was to give each place a strong identity. Well, here it is, home. Soren's set, kind of tongue-in-cheek, slightly Ken Adams, slightly James Bond vibe. He's taken the window from a spaceship and he's built it within his asteroid. And he's a bit of a dude, you know, he's got his sunken seating area. He's got a bit of taste, he's managed to get hold of a load of copper and he's made the walls made out of copper tiles and copper sort of lined tunnels, and it's real copper. We've used the real thing rather than pretending. And this window in itself was an absolute challenge. I never look out that window. When you stare into deep space, you're seeing things as they once were. When I first talked to Otto and Steven about um, their ideas about how to, to make this a possibility and they told me they wanted to use practical whenever possible, I thought they were crazy. I was like, oh yeah, good luck with that. 
you know. But then I got got here and I saw that they really do have so many working parts that, you know, the audience is gonna get a thrill out of seeing. And for the actors, it just makes it so much easier to be drawn into the moment and try to bring honesty to the moment. Soren speaks of you so often. Not that often, my dear. Not that often. These were made for Soren's hideout and tech room. We had the artistic license to make up our own idea of Soren's rubble. Having the opportunity to invent future, I think this is what a decorator's dream is. Did you bring me anything? I'm a pirate. That's what we do. But not till after dinner. The, these people are the pirates mm -hmm. who live in the rubble. And they wearing, as you see, like a spade suit. Uh, or something very similar. They go around the galaxies robbing people. They steal material from everywhere. So they need to have all the tubing to be able to breathe. Oh, we missed the whole thing. Brilliant, well done. The network of the location that we're using is enormous. It's an old network of brewery tunnels and we're building within certain sections. Here is a sense of scale is our, our world. Here's the model of our world. You've got what we call, this is the docking tube, and then you come into the loading bay area. And then here we have the souk area. And then this is our little cable car stop. So we're going to have physically the cable car in this stop whizzing out of there. And then it plunges into outer space and it crosses from one asteroid to another to Soren's home. That's freedom, man. Oh my gosh, just the amount of hard work and love that's been put into this production is incredible. I mean, the sets, like the details and everything. I wish I lived in Soren's place, like. <laughs> we don't want just people to say, oh, isn't this a cool science fiction show? We want them to sort of forget the science fiction and then focus on the story. And to do that, you have to make it look real. So designing it, the designers and the builders have created the most spectacular sets and we found the most amazing locations and, and tweaked them to make them look like you're really in the world. That's going to do it for this installment of Halo the Series Declassified. But I want to thank Charlie Murphy for stopping by to give us some insight on the key and of course all of you wonderful people for watching. Be sure to come back next week where we're gonna go all in on episode four and we'll be joined by Cortana herself, the wonderful Jen Taylor. And don't forget, you can stream new episodes of Halo every Thursday exclusively on Paramount Plus. Until then, I'm Sydney Goodman. Thanks for watching, over and out. Okay, Van Eck, place your right hand on the artifact. Slowly, please. All right, now you're left. Same as Riz. Kai125, you're up next. You're gonna need to remove your helmet. Can't miss frying the electronics. You just know Halsey will send me the bill. Okay. Is there anything wrong, ma'am? Your hair? Did you do that to yourself? Yes. Great. You don't care for us, do you, doctor? Gives you that idea. Just a hunch. I didn't know Spartans had hunches. Hunches win battles. From the age of six, I studied military strategy from Sun Tzu to Preston Cole. Riz speaks the languages and dialects of every colonized planet. Vanek's battlefield discoveries on the physics of plasma swords helped the Marines develop stronger shielded vests. You see us as machines. But if you really want to understand how we work, you're going to have to dig a little deeper. Wait! Any other tests? Ma'am. Yeah.